if they unleash this untamed upon the market, nobody would buy a katana anymore. If you follow my channel over the years, you know that for a long time I struggled to find really good longsword reproductions in the budget and mid-range that I'd be perfectly comfortable recommending. Because, well, it's all dominated by the higher-ups. You know, Albion, Lockwood, and similar price ranges. Has that changed? Well, I'm kind of giving it away already, aren't I? Would I do such a suspenseful intro if uh, nothing has changed, well, let's talk about it. So this is the Baylor Arms Type 18C Alexandria sword, based on a longsword from the arsenal of Alexandria between 1414 and 1419. Uh, this is one of a number of swords in this arsenal that were either plundered from battles or gifted to a sultan after a successful peace treaty. In this case, it might be justifiable to call it a replica rather than a reproduction, right? Because it's based on a particular historical original. I'm still going to call it reproduction because there are a few discrepancies. We'll look at that later. So first off, the blade is made of GB60 SI2 MNA, which is a Chinese made spring steel with a carbon content of 0.54 to 0.64%, which is the same as 6150 spring steel, a popular choice for swords. However, this steel here has a higher silicon content and lower chromium, which means that compared to 5160, this has somewhat less corrosion resistance due to lower chromium. But otherwise, I can't find a whole lot in terms of comparison. I don't know exactly how it stacks up. Like based on my tests, what I can say that it feels pretty similar to 5160 and 6150 for that matter. In the description, it's mentioned that the guard is fitted separately from the pommel. You know, the same way Albion does it. So this is press fitted onto the blade and it doesn't rely on compression of the grip, which usually leads to loose hilts. It's a full tan construction and it's hot peened over this peen block on top of the wheel pommel. The grip is, let me think, what's the word? Perfect. Perfect. The shape is flawless. It allows you to perfectly index the sword. You feel the edge really well. It's such a great grip. It's 100% comfortable. It looks good. It's a really nice red. The pommel, I don't like as much as the one on the Principe. Again, this is the original. It had a wheel pommel. There's nothing really wrong with it. A lot of people like wheel pommels for the look. I prefer a scent stopper pommel both in look and also feel because you can hold on to it a little bit better because this is, depending on your hand size, there isn't a whole lot of space on this. I mean, it is a fairly long grip, but um, if you hold it in a handshake grip, then you, you still hit that pommel. You can wrap your fingers around this, no problem, but you can do it better with a scent stopper pommel. And the wheel pommel tends to rub on the palm here, I've noticed. If you're thinking to yourself, hang on, that looks familiar. Where have I seen this before? Well, maybe in my review of the Albion Principe, which uses the same blade as the Alexandria, which in turn is based on the same historical original as this. And you may remember I dubbed the Principe the Konami code of cutting because of how easy it makes it. <laughs> That's the reason why some cutting competitions ban it, simply because it's too much of an advantage compared to other swords. And why is that? Well, I mean, just look at the thing. It is a remarkably wide and thin blade, and it tapers gradually from the central ridge to a really thin wafer-like edge, which um, is brutal and scary. The idea has been brought up that this blade type is perhaps shaped the way it is, thin and broad, in order to provide superior cutting ability against light armor and clothing, which makes a lot of sense. And to, at that time, European swords generally had a tendency toward narrower, thicker blades, 
which are more rigid and are better for thrusting against advanced armor. So it makes perfect sense to assume that this blade type might be designed for use in the Middle East against opponents wearing light armor and clothing. However, uh, this blade type is also portrayed in a French manuscript from 1420 showing combat between fully armored knights. Of course, with such an aggressive profile taper, it'll still thrust quite well, which is not something I was able to test at the time because I don't really have suitable materials for that at the moment. But um, generally a thicker cross section is better for that because it's not going to flex as much, of course. Anyway, so in this case, I have a rare opportunity where I can go into more detail evaluating the historical accuracy because we know what the original is, and there are definitely some differences. I took a picture of this. I tried to get it as directly from the top as possible to not distort the perspective. And then I compared it to the original and Albion's reproduction. And uh, you can see that this has a slightly different profile. If I overlay the Albion Alexandria over the original. Differences in camera lens and angle can account for minor differences because you're going to distort the shape compared to exactly how you take a picture. So that's close enough to say, yeah, it's pretty much identical. This here is more different. You can see that the profile tapers more. The original actually shows behind this overlay. So the original stays a little bit wider throughout. And the proportions of the sword are a little bit different. The guard is not quite as wide as the original and the length is slightly different. You can also see that by the measurements. The original is 111 centimeters long in total, which is 43.7 inches. Well, this Baylor Arms reproduction has a total length of 114.5 centimeters. 114 if you don't count the peen block, which the original doesn't have. So how does it matter in practical terms? Well, this one is actually a little bit lighter. The original weighs 1.64 kilograms or three pounds, 10 ounces. This weighs 1.52 kilograms or three pounds, 5.6 ounces. And the difference is in less blade presence. There's less mass in the blade, which shifts back the balance somewhat, which feels good, which means it's even more nimble. So this is extremely easy to maneuver even with one hand. However, it means less cutting power compared to the original. And here's a conspiracy theory for you. Maybe they meant to do that, especially in combination with the scabbard. Look there. You don't want to see this. A stainless steel fitting on the mouth of the scabbard. Looks nice, but sheath with caution. Because what's going on as you draw it? Well, the flat of the blade scrapes against the steel, but worse, the edge scrapes on the sides there. So basically every time you draw this, you dull the edge. So what's my conspiracy theory? They nerfed it. They put a power limiter on it. Think about it. If they unleash this untamed upon the market, nobody would buy a katana anymore. And Baylor Arms offers katanas too. And like half the anime fandom would commit seppuku. I can pretty much guarantee you there will be somebody who doesn't get that I'm obviously messing with you. So memes aside, this still cuts extremely well. I mean, a blade like this. In fact, I would contend that this is too sharp. It's too sharp for its own good. You'll see a bit later. But um, yeah, it's quite easy. I mean, these two guys with little or no prior experience in cutting tatami mats were able to perform some really respectable cuts in just one day with this sword. Yes, I could feel the difference between this and the Albion Principe, which by the way is also a threefold difference in price. This blade is not quite as overkill in ludicrous cutting performance, but it's extremely close and it cuts way above its price range. In fact, I can tell you straight up, I've never had a sub $500 sword that cuts as well as this. It's 
ridiculous. It cuts too well. Um, not really too well as such, but there is one particular problem. And that's not a problem of this reproduction, but rather the design, the original too. And that is, it's fragile. This is an extremely thin edge. And you might have already seen some hints of damage here. So I cut the usual suspects, water bottles of different shapes and sizes and thicknesses and all that, as well as tatami mats and particularly thick, hard cardboard. And it did remarkably well with everything. As long as the edge alignment is good, it'll just go right through with minimal resistance. No wonder with such blade geometry. It's designed for that. It's designed for the least possible resistance. It just shears through soft targets effortlessly and it can hack into harder materials too. After I was done with all that, I tried a piece of particle board and I was pretty gentle with it because I was expecting this edge to not be terribly durable just because of how incredibly thin it is. And uh, no problem with that. It cut into the particle board from different angles with no visible edge damage at all. So far, so good. No weird vibration in the handle. In fact, it's perfectly comfortable as you cut. So the blade harmonics, if you want to go for a technical sword nerd term, are great. No complaints here. Then I wanted to test the structural integrity some more in the most realistic way possible, which is blade on blade, the way you, you would use these in historical combat. They, a blade would meet either another blade or shields or armor or, you know, flesh and bone. I wanted to go easy on it. So no deliberate edge on edge contact. I did flat blocks and still there was edge damage, even so. Despite my precautions, it's easy for a strike to land at an angle as opposed to perfectly perpendicular right on the flat. And even just partial contact with the edge will roll it. There was edge deformation from just that, which I fixed roughly with a file, sandpaper and some flitz polishing paste. So uh, it's fine now. It's, it's what I would consider a field repair, if you will. So it's back to fully functional, but it's not flawless. Aesthetically, you can still see it. So again, that is not a problem with this particular reproduction. It doesn't matter what kind of steel you use. This is already better than what they had in history at the time. So you could use the, the greatest super steel with absolute on point, perfect heat treatment it'll still be damaged just because there's so little material. And I find that quite remarkable about the original, which I have not had a chance to examine in person, but there is a video where you can see it being handled and you can see it is just that thin. You know, it looks the same as this. That's just how they made it. So the emphasis is on cutting power over durability. All fine and good for us nowadays because for backyard cutting, this is where it's at. Yes, it's not an exact one-to-one -one replica, although it is closer than 85% of what you find on the market. And the handling characteristics are slightly different, but it's not a bad thing because it means it's easier. It's lighter and balanced a little bit closer to the hilt than the original, which means even with one hand, you can easily cut with one hand. It is a hand and a half sword after all. And it's great. So for beginners, it's fantastic, unless um, you're of the opinion that this makes cutting too easy. So it limits how much beginners will learn in cutting practice, which is true. But if you just want to cut for fun, oh yeah, this is where it's at. This exceeds every other European sword in this price range that I've ever tried. This is leagues better. I, I don't know how they do it. I don't know how they make it this affordable, um, but, but they do. So Baylor Arms made this in collaboration with LK Chen. I don't know exactly how much influence they had on the design, but either way, 
this collaboration is worth its weight in gold, as far as I'm concerned. Are there things I could nitpick? Sure, like the ends of the grip wrap here are not as clean as on an Albion, which again, I have to remind you, costs three times as much as this. But really the only thing I can criticize, and that is kind of a big deal, is this scabbard. I hate that it's made this way, where you're going to constantly dull the sword. Again, maybe that's intentional. They knew it's too sharp, it's too dangerous, it needs to be nerfed, it needs to be dulled. All memes aside, again, it's not even 100% wrong because um, with this sort of blade shape, it doesn't need to be hair popping sharp or even paper cutting sharp necessarily, which this one is the way it comes, but it doesn't need to be just because of this, this blade shape. Even if the apex of the edge is somewhat dull, this is still going to cut. Anyway, the scabbard is otherwise quite nice, especially again for the price, because often you don't even get a scabbard. It is quite nice, aside from this issue, and um, it does fit the sword extremely well. In this case, I'm a little bit concerned about how tight the fit is, because again, that means steel on steel contact, but I'm probably going to cut off a strip here, or I suppose you could grind it on a belt grinder too until you see wood. Or another option would be to glue leather or something over it. Anyway, I'm going to carefully sheathe it. And when I do that, it, the edge doesn't actually rub. It's really just if you, as you pull it, you put a little bit more pressure in one direction than the other, so then it'll, it'll rub on one side. If you're careful, it shouldn't really happen, but either way, I, I don't like it. But it's the only thing I don't like. While I'm still gushing about it, I should also mention that this was sent to me for free to review. So there might be bias, there isn't. Anyway, link to it will be down below in the description as usual, as well as the specs, all the good stuff. Hope you found this review helpful. Thanks for watching and take care.